Good evening, and welcome to another edition of the Shadow Trader Video Weekly for Sunday, January 26th, 2020. My name, of course, is Peter Reznicek from ShadowTrader.net. No fancy intro uh, this week, just a little bit uh, press for time. And we also have lots to talk about this week, obviously, because Friday was the first day that there was any real selling in the market, and it was kind of real selling. I'm going to show you exactly why that is, but also why I am not yet short this market, as is the title of the video, and here's why. So I'm going to go through a number of factors that at least for me are not really giving the signal yet uh, of a change in tone. All right, so let's start with the charts uh, as we always do. Obviously, this is the candle in question on Friday. You can see we had pretty strong selling. It was one of the larger red candles we've had in a while. I'm just kind of looking at all the large, all the red bars going back all the way to the beginning of the rally, which is right here on October 3rd. Probably the biggest bar, I would say. Largest uh, selling day. Uh, but obviously in the past, those days have not really led to anything, you know, any type of follow through. So that's one thing. So one day certainly uh, does not make a trend. The other thing I want to point out to everybody is pattern wise, one of the main things you want to look at as far as whether or not a market is bearish or bullish, keep it really simple. Just use the 20 period moving average, simple moving average, not exponential. I use this a lot. Uh, those of you who have been following me forever, you know that I'm only interested in the 20, the 50, and the 200. And really out of those, the 20 and the 50 are the most important. And this market, uh, as far as the S&P cash is concerned, has not yet crossed anywhere near the 20 period moving average. Now beyond that, once you've got your moving average uh, set and you know whether you're above or below it, the next thing you want to look at is just simple trend, right? I'm a huge believer in diagonal lines, trend lines. So this particular phase of this rally has been going since, as I said before, early October. This is the start point right here. Okay, and then it, stayed, it rallied, rallied, rallied. You had a little bit of a pullback here. That established the trend line with these two anchors. And obviously that comes out to here. Interestingly enough, notice that where it comes out to, it's the backside of the trend channel. Right? This was the trend channel that I was saying that we then broke above. And when you break out of the trend channel to the upside and you get kind of hockey stick parabolic, you have a larger chance of some sort of a liquidation break occurring. All right. And the liquidation break, by the way, and I'm, I'm not really I'm not flat out calling it that because remember, a liquidation break is something that it's a specific type of selling that reverses itself very quickly. But remember, this is that the break that we got on Friday was news driven. And that is very, very important to note is that the break was news driven because of the virus scare. Those types of things can very often leave a market as fast as they come. Just to kind of play it out, what if there are no new cases over the entire uh, weekend? The market may look at that and say, okay, it's contained. That's all there was. And it moves on to the next piece of news. As we've seen over and over, the market has a very, very short attention span. And that attention span seems to be getting shorter and shorter as time goes by. So we'll keep that uh, in mind uh, as well. All right. Now, now that we've looked at the pattern, of everything and we know where we are in relation to the 20 MA and in relation to the trend line we should at the very least spend a little bit of time looking at what the market internals were like on Friday to see if they confirm or deny the selling so I will say this they were bearish and I believe that they do confirm the selling but not in as big of a way as you would expect I did not see any uh, numbers here that were just Armageddon ish uh, the mo most bearish read that I saw on the breath, I think at the low of the day, was in the seven or eight to one range. That's pretty good, I would, must say. Believe me, I'm not trying to poo-poo that. That is decent selling. But we closed at minus five, and the NASDAQ closed at minus three. Um, those of you who are not familiar, this is just simply the breath ratio. And it shows us what is the uh, ratio of buying pressure in terms of volume that's flowing into down stocks versus volume that's flowing into up stocks. And in this case, at the end of the day, the amount of volume that was going into down stocks was five times the amount of volume that was going into up stocks on the NICE. And on the NASDAQ, it was about three and a half times. All right. Uh, advancers, decliners. Closing at minus 1,200. Again, very, very bearish days have like minus 2,000s. It can get much, much lower. 
I thought that was interesting that we stop there. And the all-important tick indicator. I talk about the distribution of the ticks, which simply tells us over the course of the day whether the 15-minute bars are closing above or below zero. And notice that, yes, it's kind of in favor of the bears, but not by a whole lot. There was some pretty strong tick action here when we rallied. A more bearish day would have ticks that even on a counter trend rally here would just kind of go to the zero line and fade and we'd have most of the tick action staying underneath all right cumulative tick did have a nice build to the downside i would say that's bearish but it didn't close on the low it actually rallied up to here however i will say this is definitely one for the bears and that minus three thousand is a is a pretty bearish read so i i, I will say that pretty bearish read okay let's move into the profile uh, side of things and we'll see if that also supports our case for not yet getting short or not so there's a number of nuances here that are important to point out that really put things into perspective the first is that we didn't really have a very good and strong excess high at the top you only need two TPOs to call it excess excess are these single prints here in this D period you only need two to actually officially call it excess but when I see that number like this which is like say five TPOs or less, especially when it's sitting on a, a pretty well-developed body like that, I tend to call that lack of material excess. And it's kind of a red flag to me that I kind of think in the back of my mind, hmm, perhaps this auction did not end uh, properly just yet. Obviously, you know, the excess high is the mark that the auction has ended and we're moving on to the next auction in the other direction, however long that may, may be. But again, it's not the most excessy high. I would have if it really was a capitulation on the upside, I would have liked to have seen a larger spike with more single prints, okay? That being said, there's also the fact that we had three sessions here between uh, these two overnights and one RTH, which really all together form kind of a poor high. If I put all these sessions together, it would give me a flat top like this. Well, remember, when you have a lot of longs, trapped at the exact same area that's called a poor high the first inclination is for those longs to start to sell away from that however because those long because those shorts are not very strong hands they're not in it for the long term they're mostly just long liquidators who had bad location because they got trapped up at the top and they never got like a push to the upside to make any money on their longs those shorts tend to get run over so that's another thing that i'm kind of keeping in mind going into next week is that the sell-off happened to me probably because there were some longs trapped there and then also news driven which i also kind of you know keep that with like a, just a grain of salt in my mind when things are more news driven i like to see selling that is more technically driven at certain key areas or failure at resistance points or things like things like that so that's one thing that i'm carrying forward forward beyond that structure on friday was just so so certainly this is just panicky notice that all the way down here it's tons of single prints it's it's constantly single prints breaking up the distributions which put it into like you know this is a one this is a two, this one is three, there's a single print, this one is four, and on down the line. So when the profile is split up into multiple distributions, that is a sign that the selling is more panicky and it's more emotional. It's just kind of happening too fast, too, you know, too quickly all at once, and those sellers are not really using their heads. Now, as the day developed, we did get a little bit better profile down on the bottom, and we did get POC migration uh, to the downside somewhat. I mean, it's kind of closer to the lower third rather than uh, at the bottom. Uh, volume did fill in quite a bit here, which is decent, um, and also filled in here, which is decent. What I would be looking for here is if all of these were just four-digit numbers and not five-digit numbers, I would discount the selling a little bit more. But because the volume came in, you can see here we've got three TPOs wide, we got four here, we got five here, and the numbers kind of stacked up a little. I do put a little bit more weight on that other than if it was just one big uh, taper of volume like this and the volume would come, would look like that and taper down to the bottom. So that also is a little bit of a feather in, feather, you know, in the cap of the sellers. All right. Last but not least on the profile, I purposely left this virgin point of control marker here. It was number 13 before the day started on Friday. We had 13 VPOCs and here's 
where you have to go back to what I've been saying about these poor structure points underneath and how they are going to get cleaned up at some point. So this one obviously got cleaned up today and there was also a small gap above us that needed filling that got taken care of. But remember, that still leaves a lot below us. Now that's not really a bullish sign. That's actually a bearish sign because the market could be pulled to all these places, right? We have gaps that need to be filled. We still have six gaps left to fill and we have 12 virgin points of control. Okay, that's a lot of poor structure that needs to be cleaned up. So if you're going to be looking short, probably a good signal is going to be if we were able to take out the low of Friday, you should be targeting some of these areas. Don't go for a small gain, go for a bigger gain and look for at least that first VPOC at 32.59 as a target. And after that, then you'd be looking at this, this uh, particular gap here, which is in like the 32.06 to 32.12 level. Okay, so just keep that in mind. All that structure is still there and there is potential for it to get retraced and repaired as we call it in um, in market profile uh, terminology. All right. Last but not least, I want to talk a little bit about the earnings season and what is going on next week. And this also ties in with what I was saying in terms of that I am not short yet. One of the reasons also that I'm not short yet, and those of you who are in my weekly options advisory can attest to this, is because we were making good money with Netflix, which actually had a great day on um on Friday and didn't really sell off much at all. It actually made a nice new high and at the end of the day it managed to hold up slightly above the midpoint of its range. So sometimes when you've got really good longs on and you've got size on and you need to to manage those, sometimes you're more focused on that rather than than uh, getting short. One of the other things however uh, that also weighs on my mind as far as getting short uh, for next week is the fact that next week is an extremely uh, heavy earnings week and that is as far as the FANG stock is going to be kicked off by Apple on Tuesday. Okay, now this stock still looks extremely bullish, but I don't want to really bring this down to just Apple. It's really about the entire week. We're talking Apple, Starbucks, Facebook, Amazon, Caterpillar, Tesla, uh, Microsoft, um, what else can I mention? Boeing, AMD. Okay, all of this is happening in one week. So the point I'm trying to make is, from my perspective at least, it doesn't make sense to me to get any sort of bearish, long-term or even short-term bearish ahead of all of these reports. Apple comes out with good news on uh, Tuesday, gaps up the market on uh, Wednesday morning, right? You could be heavily short into that and that Apple is obviously a big driver of the S&P. ES is going to open up 25. Okay, your short is dead in the water. Think about that. Microsoft comes out with good numbers, same thing, et cetera, et cetera. Amazon is going to be on Thursday p.m. They gap up. What happens to your shorts, right? So just keep that in mind. For me personally, it just doesn't feel like the right thing to do to be getting heavily short here, given everything I've showed you and ahead of earnings. So last but not least, I'll just recap back where I started. If this is it, and it could be. Remember, I have no way of knowing that. When I say this is it, meaning that that's it. The market's not going up anymore in 2020 or at least for the next three or four months. Okay, We will know by a daily close underneath the 20 MA and we will know furthermore by a daily close underneath this longer term trend line which started in October. If the market cannot even do either of those two things, then in my opinion, there is no reason to be getting short this market. 